Okay, look, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining a very important uh, uh, webinar. Um, I'll just say a couple of words and then I'll introduce uh, Rebecca and Yvonne. Um, so as uh, no one will need reminding uh, about the events that uh, we have heard about uh, in Rochdale following uh, the inquest towards the end of last year, and I know that there's been a considerable amount of reflection in the sector about what they heard during that inquest about the events that uh, led up to the tragic death of uh, our Bishak um, and what are the lessons that can be uh, learnt from, uh, from the events that unfolded. And obviously we as an ombudsman have shared our insights and learning but the landlord itself, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, has also clearly been reflecting on, on what happened. So this webinar is an opportunity for you to hear from us uh, with our lessons following our special investigation into, into, the, uh, in, 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 into the complaints that we were seeing with the landlord and how they spoke to some of the issues that were heard at the inquest. But also to hear from Yvonne, who uh, for the last few months has been the interim chief executive at the borough as the borough at, at Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, as the landlord seeks to recover uh, from uh, from these events. Um, we um, the only uh, point I would stress is that I and it's a point I made at the inquest when I gave evidence, and it's a point that we've made in the report that we published recently, is that what uh, some of the issues that I saw uh, in this uh, uh, landlord are, I think, things which I see elsewhere in the casework that we handle. And therefore, I think even though the outcomes were extreme in relation to our Abishak, actually this is something that could uh, be repeated elsewhere and therefore it's fundamentally important to try and get focus on how to improve services so that residents do not experience the kind of detriment that that we have seen there um so rebecca um is our head of um uh, insight and she will um uh, present uh show you a presentation which um distills the report that we published, gives you a bit more context for it, as well as the recommendations that we made. And then Yvonne very kindly will share her experiences and her insights, having been at Rochdale Borough White Housing for the last few months. And then crucially, there's an opportunity for everyone to both ask questions, but also share your experiences, your insights and your learning. And so hopefully this is, a, is an opportunity for a proper discussion, as well as for you to hear from from uh, the two presenters. Um, so thanks again for joining and I'll hand over to Rebecca. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, Mark, can you just say, can you enable uh, screen sharing for me, please? Should all be done. It is, thank you very much. Smooth as you like, folks, smooth as you like. Okay, hopefully, that has worked. Yep. Okay. I'm going to get crack, crack, crash on in, in, in the hope that it has. Okay. So this is a very, very quick run through of the lessons that we uh, took from our special investigation into Rochdale Borough Wide Housing. Um, it's worth uh, saying that, you know, we, the, the purpose of this, these are very much, okay, fine, there are lessons for the individual landlord, but they are absolutely lessons for the entire sector to, to take heed of. And I would echo Rick's point that it, it is highly unlikely that these this set of scenario um, could, could only have happened here. So that's just the first point to make. So what are paragraph 49 investigations? Um, so the, the core things that we are looking at when we look into an individual landlord is whether there is an underlying policy weakness in why we are seeing what we are seeing whether there are repeated times that the service provision has failed, whether when the service provision fails, it fails across numbers of service provision areas, so there is something about the culture that's driving it, whether it's happening in more than one location at any one time, so again, there's something endemic going on as well. 
we will also take a really close look at whether the, the culture surrounding complaints is a positive one and they're taking learning from the complaints. And we also look at what the oversight and governance of a landlord looks like so they have the ability to identify and act on repeated issues. As Rick has said, one of the core reasons for choosing Rochdale Borough Wide Housing was the outcome of the inquest into the death of a Wabishak that found that the presence of damper mould in his home was a leading contributing to factor to why he died. Um, we took a look at the complaints that we had on our casebook for Rochdale Borough Wide Housing. We also took a look at the determinations we'd made for the landlord previously, as well as what they'd said to us. They'd actually provided a response to the call for evidence that we did in 2020. 21 for our spotlight report on damp and mould. That combined to give us a concern that the landlord's approach to damp and mould reports, as well as the respect afforded to residents when they made that service request, could be lacking. So what did we do? We went and we looked very, very closely at the cases we previously determined for the landlord to see if we could pull out themes and trends in them. And obviously we worked our live investigations to see what was current now, as well as seeing what residents were phoning us about, emailing us about right now about their experience of Rochdale Borough Wide Housing. We also made a substantive evidence request to the landlord to ensure that we really, really dug into what it was that we were seeing. I'll give you an example of the evidence request. I saw a question earlier, are the slides going to be made available? Yes, they will be. Um, but the th sorts of things that we asked for were what were the relevant policies that govern the service provision we were looking at? What did the what the void standards like? So what was the standard to which that they brought their homes up to after someone had moved out before someone else moved in? What information was given to tenants when they signed up on the home and how to manage their home? The kinds of conversations and the stock responses that customer contact centres were expected to be giving to people when they phoned up to report down per mould, what training they staff had had, who they were, what training had they had to get an insight into how, why they dealt with certain things in the way that they had. The landlord stated publicly after the inquest that they'd made some changes and identified some learning, so we asked them for the details of that. We also specifically asked them to self-assess if they hadn't done so already against the Spotlight Report's 26 recommendations, and we got a copy of that. We asked for their self-assessments against the code, complaint handling code, and we also asked for the details of the databases that they used to manage their service provision and what sort of data got recorded by it. Our key findings were that the, the root cause of service failure within Rochdale Borough White Housing was a propensity to dismiss residents and their concerns out of hand, with staff believing that they knew better and that the expectations of their residents were unreasonable. We found recurring instances of residents being treated in dismissive, inappropriate, unsympathetic ways, and sometimes the language used was actually derogatory. So a culturing of othering, of treat believing that residents were somebody other than themselves and therefore they didn't need the same level of respect. That attitude was then further exacerbated by a poor standard of culture, customer service when they did require accept that action was needed because the databases did not share information and the record keeping was incredibly poor and incorrect methods were used to manage the service response, there was then a poor service as a result, even when it was accepted that something was necessary. And I will echo what Rick has said at the beginning, it's highly unlikely that that endemic behaviour of othering is isolated to just one landlord. So what we are saying to the entire social housing sector is they need to consider whether they need to turn over their stone and do a deep dive into the culture and whether you're living a social purpose, particularly when looking at recruitment um, and training and embedding a culture that encourages people to um, embrace diversity. So I will now very quickly go through our findings. I would stress, please do go and read the report. It gives this in a lot more detail and is much more eloquent than I can be in the time that I've got today. But we talk, we found that the landlord didn't go far enough to find its silences. So it didn't go far enough to find the people who weren't telling them about something that was going on, particularly in relation to damp and mould. When they did do an independent review following Awab Zishak's death, they didn't find most of the damp and mould that a subsequent survey in late 2022 did find. So 80% of the freehold estate suffers with damp and mould or suffered with damp and mould. And 12 of the houses on the freehold estate at, into December 2022 were category one hazards, which means that they were a risk to, to health and life. 
But we also found that it isn't just the freeholder state that were contacting us. So when we looked at the cases of residents contacting us now, it wasn't just the freeholder state. And again, that was something the landlord weren't necessarily aware of. We found that this perfectly exemplified the concerns that we have that one off stock surveys or one off methodologies are never going to be the, 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 the win for finding silence. It requires a range of methods using skilled professionals to be really effective. We did find that the website is now a lot better than it was when we first started looking at this. There is now a banner across the website that says, please dedicate our, visit our dedicated page on damper mold if they've got concerns. And the diverse languages that is spoken by Rochdale's um, residents have now been recognised in the most recent damper mold condensation leaflet. However, the website's content strike a slightly uneasy balance. There's a bit too much information about what the landlord will do in response to, um, there's a bit too much information about what the landlord expects the resident to do to manage their homes, and there's not quite enough detail about what the landlord will do in response to a damper mould request. So it will tell them how often they'll check in once the issue's been fixed, but it won't tell them how long it will take to fix if it's not considered urgent. And there are general points made about what a landlord will do to resolve a mould report but they have quite specific instructions to the resident about what they should do to perform prevent condensation form. The emphasis is still on resident precautionary measures. So we've said that that area, that guidance, which is good guidance on how to maintain a healthy home, needs to be separate in an area for people who are looking to maintain a healthy home, either because the mill's been treated or it hasn't developed, separate to what are we going to do once there's a problem. We also said that the leaflet for um, handling condensation could inadvertently suggest the landlord's only responsible for uh, leaks, penetrative damp, rising damp, rather than condensation issues, because the pictures in the leaflet are only of those issues. So anyone wanting who can't read English, written English, or um, requires pictures to understand information wouldn't necessarily realise that the landlord was also saying condensation can cause mould as well. Respect and fairness. This was the largest area of our findings and that tallies into the key recommendations we've made and the core key findings that I mentioned previously. So in the case of a Wabs family, when the mould issues were reported, the landlord focused entirely on the way that the parents were using his home without considering if there was anything about the home that contributed to the problems. And of course, subsequently it was ascertained that the fan, the bathroom fan was a bit faulty and there was inadequate ventilation to the kitchen as well. The, the people who attended the home assumed that the family practiced ritual bathing because somebody else had spoken to some other people in the block who shared an ethnic characteristic similarity with them, that that probably meant that this family did too, but they never actually had that conversation with them. And their religious beliefs and everything that was the basis of that assumption were never actually discussed. We saw in the evidence bundle that went to the inquest a lot of othering statements, I won't list them all out, but they are in the final report, um, that demonstrated that the family themselves weren't seen. They didn't look at the people and see them. They based their, everything about their treatment was based on they look like these other people and therefore that's how they live. So what it combined together was it painted a slightly disturbing picture of residents being judged entirely by previously held prejudices as well as some really lazy assumptions and some attitudes towards asylum seekers and refugees that, that just aren't acceptable. The 2021 review also showed that there was still a propensity by staff towards making residents responsible for the situation. So, for example, some of the people that, that gave um, answers in the 2021 review talked about trickle vents might have become blocked if they hadn't been cleaned. Um, another member of staff offered to check out if the family were using gas and electricity appropriately to see if they were heating the home sufficiently. So, again, it was staff just looking for reasons why the residents might have been responsible for the situation. All the staff said that when they were handling the mould reports, they would have taken more action if they'd known that a child resided at the property. But no one ever asked that question during the handling of the damper mould thing. So how would they have known if they hadn't asked? So what we've said is it ought to have been part of any risk assessment of the situation to find out who lives there and therefore who is going to be affected by the, the situation that is presenting on the mould. One staff member said, you know, his mum was visibly pregnant with, the, with their second child. She was visibly upset and visibly distressed, but they, she still wasn't referred to the safeguarding programme, Eyes Wide Open, which is specifically designed for 
concerns for welfare, frailty, you know, any, any other need is specifically a program for, I'm concerned about this resident and I would like this looking into deeper. But because the mob was considered a standard repair, she wasn't referred, even though she was greatly distressed by the situation. A month later, Awaba died because of that mould and it was finally declared a category one hazard, so again, risk to life. So even if they, the staff member had held the belief that the mould was standard, it's difficult to understand how a visibly distressed pregnant woman wasn't referred to the safeguarding programme, particularly since it's specifically designed to identify and help people in distress. This wasn't just something that we saw on um, reviewing the evidence surrounding a Wab's family either. Our recent investigations identified that residents were often viewed as challenging or uncooperative because they had outgrown the uh, original assigned property. People have children. It, it is a reality. And, and you know, that that is that is not a being challenging or uncooperative. Um, we also saw examples of um, residents perceiving that they were being unfairly treated because of their race when they saw a difference in racial disparity, uh, sorry, a difference in race between what they were receiving as a service versus what their neighbour was receiving. And we also, we when we looked deeper into what kind of culture is, is, is embedded in the landlord in terms of respect and fairness, the respect training happened at the beginning when people started with their career with the, with the landlord, but there was no evidence that, that was repeated during their career. Knowledge, we saw missing repair records, we saw different systems holding different information, we saw repairs information logged against the wrong address, we saw individual staff computers containing information which then wasn't saved to a cloud so no one else could use it, and we saw individual email accounts being used to manage repairs as well. Um, this was particularly pertinent for Rochdale because in late 2020 the uh, migration of their computer system meant they lost all their previous emails, so essentially to all extents and purposes any e man incidents managed by email before 2020, the records disappeared completely. So the lack of synchronization between multiple databases that's being discussed in a lot of forums at the moment for a while, but had particularly profound consequences. The CRM database that contained all the information about the tenancy and the service requests made about the home was listed his father as the only person that lived there. Everything in the database for managing reallocation requests contained details that he, of his mother, the fact that she was pregnant and the fact that there was a two year old in the home. It was also through the reallocation request that the midwife raised the concerns about the mould. That information never received, re reached the repairs department. We also saw that lack of knowledge management within our own cases. So we saw an example where the resident was given the wrong date for her tenancy to end. The landlord knew it was the wrong date, didn't tell her. And then when she'd only half partially moved out, they changed the locks and removed everything from her home, including her parents' ashes, but then weren't able to say that what they had removed from her because they kept no records at all from it either. Uh, we also saw examples of knowledge not being used, meaning that people weren't getting very good service. So somebody had had historic draining, drainage issues for their entire block of flats. That information was there on the system, but they still sent a plumber who then confirmed that a drainage team was needed, which was exactly what the system would have been able to tell them if anyone had interrogated it. Disrepairs culture. It was really clear from the evidence submitted to the inquest and what we've reviewed during our investigation that any damp and mould inspection happened solely as a result of a disrepair claim was looked entirely through the lens of is the landlord legally liable for what has caught for is there a leak is there rising damp is there penetrating damp and are we legally liable so the disrepair claims culture had completely overtaken the customer services culture of is this an acceptable situation for our resident to be living in and what do we need to do about it what we oh that's sorry beg your pardon um so sorry let me just confirm my notes that skip forward a bit that's quite frustrating Right, back in the game, apologies for that. Um, so what we also found was that it, because this, this legal disrepairs culture was, was prevalent, if somebody, if there were identified repairs needed to a home, if there was an associated disrepair claim, they were effectively parked. Um, ostensibly, this was because the authorization had to go to the legal department to be sent to the disrepair solicitor for approval, and that all incurred a time delay. That isn't what the policy actually said when considering the priority of the, of the work done. 
So for example, for a WABS family, they were inspected in November 2020. The internal email listed all the repairs needed, including the bathroom fan, installing a kitchen fan, possibly a ventilation unit, as well as treating the severe mold. But the email specifically said, none of this is going to get ticketed to fraction because of the disrepair claim. The email then carried on to say that a Welb's mother might have been unaware of what she'd signed up for when taking out the disrepair claim because English wasn't her first language, but there still wasn't any recognition that maybe that was a reason to refer the situation to the Eyes Wide Open Safeguarding campaign or to action repairs regardless of the fact there was a disrepair claim going on. The saddest thing about it all is that the internal email prompted a check to see whether the legal, the, the Awab's family solicitors replied to the July 2020 report. No reply had been received, but nobody chased the solicitors and essentially nothing got done. Learning. Until the inquest, the landlord didn't show a strong ability to learn from its mistakes or take opportunities to improve from them. The review that they did of the situation for the inquest concentrated entirely on barriers to information sharing and knowledge retention. It focused completely on improving the process with limited lessons on how to improve customer service and no recognition of the duty of the care that it had failed to provide a Wab and his family. Again, this reflected the prevailing culture we found process orientated and that it completely lost sight of the people at the heart of the service it provides. It was only once the coroner made it clear that they considered the lack of action on the mould to be responsible for Awab's death that the landlord then looked at what more it could do to support the people reporting mould to them and what it needed to remove the blame language from that conversation. We also found complaints are an opportunity to learn and the complaint policy is not as thorough as we would expect and it doesn't include aspects that are outlined in our complaint handling code. In particular, it incorrectly states that a serious complaint will go straight to stage two to be handled, but that means a really serious complaint only gets one stage of handling. It's actually more unfair to, for, for a serious complaint. It goes against the culture of fair and equal treatment that the code is seeking to cultivate. So, what were the key recommendations we've had? And I will be quick because I'm aware of time. We have asked the landlord to publish the outcome of the 2023 review that they are doing currently, the lessons learned reviewed, and that the resulting action plan is published. We've asked them to construct a dedicated strategy for handling damp and mold reports that they receive, and we've listed out key areas that that needs to cover. We have also uh, asked them to separate the guidance on how to report mould from the guidance on how to maintain a healthy home. We've asked for specific guidance to residents on how to access the complaint system, really selling what the complaint system can do for residents as opposed to pursuing a disrepair claim. We've also asked for a review on the guidance of maintaining a healthy home by damp and condensation and mould specialist in conjunction with residents to make certain it is as understandable and accessible and applicable as possible. We've asked them to consider additional community events and open surgeries to discuss condensation management methods that shouldn't just focus on those estates where there are known damp and mold issues because it is an issue for everybody. We live in a damp country. We've asked them to do a training program for re of re-education on courtesy and respect. And we've specifically asked for an education program about asylum seekers and refugees, again, with regular refreshment sessions. We've asked them for a program of exception reporting. That's where the data must be wrong to management on data quality, which includes the data provided to the landlord by the local authority from rehoming applications. And we've said there needs to be feedback mechanisms for possible disciplinary action where data record keeping is found to be at fault. We've also said we want explicit reporting on those follow-up inspections the landlord says they're going to do six, 12 and 18 months after a damp and mould report has been closed, which and we that should identify properties where appointments have not been kept, they've been missed, what are the reasons for that, what measures have been taken to resolve that. We've asked the landlord to prioritise a survey of all residents and their tenants to um, to an attendancy audit to establish who's living in their homes, what are the vulnerabilities and are their children present? And we've also asked them to publish the outcome of the stock condition surveys that they're doing currently and their resulting action plan. We've asked them to review their eyes wide open safeguarding campaign so that they are clearer on the triggers reporting households to the campaign because obviously a wild family weren't reported. And we've asked for an addition to the objectives of people who are working the maintenance sections to proactively notice who is living in the homes and when there are signs of distress, be that financial, emotional, physical, and whether there are any issues with the condition of the home when they go to visit for other reasons.
We've also said we would like them to review, which should include an anonymous staff survey of the usage of this whistleblowing policy in the past five years to identify areas that are not being reported and why staff don't feel safe to raise their concerns. One of the things we saw in this was that the whistleblowing policy the whistleblowing mechanisms weren't being used and that people when they contacted us as a result of our investigation said I didn't feel safe to raise my issues internally. We've asked for a review of the job descriptions for all front facing staff to ensure that customer focus and the landlord's values are present throughout the job descriptions to make certain that it's really clear that this is what your job is and these are the values that you are living. And we've also said we'd like the recruitment process for front facing staff to be reviewed to ensure that that customer focus and again those stated values form the backbone of the testing process so that the right people come in from the beginning. And then finally, we've said we want an updated and co-compliant complaint policy. We'd like the alliance of the planned governance reporting to be our our aligned to our guidance note on what does good look like in the governance reporting. And we want a creation of a managing unacceptable behaviours policy that aligns with the governance on our website on, on that topic. And then obviously, at the end of all that, we would like an updated self-assessment responding to all the sections. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, great, thanks very much, uh, uh, Rebecca. So, Vaughn, um, uh, over to you, folks. If you have questions uh, that you want to ask during this, then um, please pop them in the chat function, and and and, and we'll try and pick them up. Um, Vaughn, thanks, Richard. Thanks, Rebecca, um, and hi to everyone. So, um, I was asked to give it ten minutes. So clearly, I can't go through everything that we're currently doing at RBH, but just to give a kind of flavour of some of the stuff. So I started in December in amongst the midst of everything that was going on at RBH um, and was told that the Ombudsman was doing this investigation and then we had a downgrade from the regulator. So it wasn't the greatest kind of first week of starting, but clearly in the preceding months before this was published, we'd been looking at a lot of things ourselves. So trying to see what we found, what we thought, what was going on. Um, <clears throat> we did find very quickly that we had a widespread damper mold issue. It had not been seen as a major kind of concern uh, previously at RBH. And I think a lot of assumptions were made around condensation being the, the primary cause of that. Um, <clears throat> there was lots of information and none of it had been triangulated. So there was a real, um, sense of data, a sense of information around complaints, disrepair claims, you know, stock condition, what tenants were telling us, but nobody had really put that all together to see that there was a major damper mould issue. Um, we found very poor complaints handling, uh, where there were pockets of staff, I would say, that were dismissive of tenants who weren't empathetic, and there hadn't been a resolution approach. It was almost a kind of, you know, actually, they're causing us problems and we heard the term serial complainers a few times and people weren't thinking that actually had they resolved issues in the first instance, people wouldn't continue to complain. Um, we found systems that weren't talking to each other. You couldn't find one version of the truth. Um, it was all very disparate and complicated policies and procedures. And staff said to me, it's like walking through treacle to try and get anything done. They were very disempowered. Um, people were raising concerns, but they weren't really going anywhere. So again, very process driven and limited options for the tenant's voice to be heard. You know, we're a mutual organization. You would assume because of that, we have greater tenant engagement um, and that wasn't what we found. So we'd found a lot of things and we're working on a lot of things before the report was published. And we knew it wasn't gonna be good um, and it was very painful to read, but it wasn't unexpected. So although we knew much of it, there were still lots of lessons to be learned for us, um, but also for the sector, I think, as Richard said. So I could obviously spend the whole hour just going through what we found, but I've picked out a few of the key ones, which I think will be useful for people. So this issue of the term of othering, I have to say, was a very strange term when we first saw it. It wasn't something that we'd used a lot or thought about a lot. And so we, we did do quite a bit of thinking about what that meant. Um, and for us, it was just about staff thinking that they knew best um, and that they were very dismissive of tenants. Um, it wasn't just a race issue, I would say, because in the complaints, certainly that the Ombudsman looked at, a lot of those were white British families. 
So, you know, we were dismissive of everyone, really, is what I would say. Um, and that is obviously an over-exaggeration because we've got some really good staff who do a really good job, but there were these pockets of really difficult, um, you know, ways of behaving, really. Um, and it was what was really interesting for me a few weeks ago. One of those people who I would say is one of our good staff said to me, I read the report and I recognised myself in some of the things that were said and I was ashamed because I actually didn't mean it to be like that. I didn't want it to come across like that. So I think there's been reflection for the whole kind of staff team um, at RBH about the way they talk to people. Um, so we clearly needed a culture shift and we've been doing a huge amount of work on that. Um, but I think all associations run the risk of having pockets of this. I've been in the sector a long time um, and I've heard over the years statements like, you know, tenants should be grateful that they've got a home. You know, they're really lucky. My daughter can't find anywhere. Um, you know, people saying things like, have you ever tried to get a plumber out? You know, where tenants were, were requesting something and were saying that I'm still waiting. So I just think that there is pockets of this everywhere and the best way to lift the lid on it is to ask the tenants so I've spent quite a bit of time going out and meeting with tenants in their homes did an open invitation out to say look if you you know if you want to talk to me I'm happy to do that I've had phone conversations but also many many visits with tenants and I just think it's really important that people through the organization get to talk to the tenants and listen to what they've got to say because they'll tell you exactly what it's like and that's where you can learn from um, the second thing for us with this issue of not triangulating information, as housing associations, we have a huge amount of information um, at our disposal and, and we at RBH weren't using it to tell us what was going on um, with our properties or even with our kind of tenants. So we got standard information coming in, so around complaints, which was, you know, themes, percentage of complaints that were around repairs, you know, percentage that were around attitudes of staff, but nothing was dug deeper. There wasn't a curiosity to actually find out what that meant um, and if it was much more widespread. Um, you know, we'd had really high disrepair claims, higher than I'd ever seen anywhere, and almost all of them cited damp and mould. Um, and obviously we'd had the really tragic death of a WAB, but we still weren't joining those dots. Um, so we have information, we all have lots of information. So what do we do with it and what is it really telling us? And then trying to think about how we really learn from complaints. You know, what's actually in those complaints? What, what is the underlying? Um, and we've made a lot of changes and our complaint staff now talk to the tenants when complaints come in so that they get that kind of first-hand discussion from people. And then the other one for me was finding the silence. So again, this was one that came through quite um, strongly in the Para 49. And I do think that this can resonate with all of us because how do we know what we don't know? That was the thing for me. How do we know what we actually don't know? So in December, just giving damp and mould as an example, we did a call out for tenants to tell us. We said, you know, we're listening, we're here, tell us if you've got an issue with damp and mould. And I have to say, it was like an avalanche. So people were waiting for permission from us to tell us. So when we did say to them, tell us, it just came in, you know, and there were obviously issues in dealing with that amount of information, but it meant that they wanted to tell us. And then we set up an every visit counts system, anyone going into anyone's property, um, look for damp and mould, do a check. Um, and again, we found quite a lot of the damp and mould that way as well. So then we started mapping it across Rochdale to say, do we have any hotspots? You know, what are we learning from the information that we've got? And when we then overlaid it with ethnicity of the households to see if there was an issue. And what we did find was that there were groups of our tenants who weren't apparently reporting things to us. Um, and we had that information. So it's now needing to work out what we do with that and how we make sure that they can engage. So, you know, we're doing a 100% stock condition survey this year. We have a damp and mold task force. We are looking at root causes. And the other thing that clearly has come out of it is looking at the level of investment in our existing homes. So that wasn't explicit in the report, but it was something that came out of, of what we were looking at. Um, and we found quite clearly that development of new homes had overtaken investment in our existing homes and that there had been underinvestment. Um, so not just around damp and mould, but a more general picture. And the balance had certainly shifted between investing in existing homes and um, 
developing new things which are absolutely needed and I know that but there are lots of reasons for it as well you know government policy has pushed us to develop and develop develop um, you know, funding has changed, so regenerating existing homes, existing, you know, investing in existing homes, that funding isn't as easy to get or isn't available. The rent cuts didn't help. But behind all of that, what we'd found is, is that we had a lot of homes that we could not be proud of. Um, and I think that others will find the same if they look. So although I wouldn't recommend any of you ask for a Para 49 investigation, um, they can be very painful, but they are also very insightful. Um, and it really is worth seeing what lessons you can take from others um, and not assuming that everything is fine in your association, being brave enough to lift the lid. So there are, you know, we are going through a lessons learned piece at the moment, which is going to be a big piece of work. And we will look at what we can share um, once that's um, been completed. And there are a few of us on here from RBH today, so we're more than happy to take any questions. Uh, super, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Vaughan. Very insightful, very thoughtful. Um, OK, so we've got some uh, questions, and perhaps I could start with uh, Sarah and Sarah's uh, questions, which uh, relate to each other, and they concern uh, vulnerability. Um, so Sarah's question is, what are, you, what are your thoughts on implementing a vulnerability policy and do other organisations have it? And Sarah's question is, in terms of vulnerability policy, what would you envisage it achieving? Just trying to work out if current policies for safeguarding, if they consider level, lower level flags, would be inadequate or would, would be adequate. Um, so perhaps uh, to give you a chance to catch your breath, Yvonne, um, Rebecca, would you like to have a, um, uh, a go at that and then Yvonne? So, yeah, sorry. So it's a, the question is about vulnerability policies and whether we think that they should have them as standard. Yeah, and what they should seek to achieve. So it's, it's a really good question and it's particularly topical because we are starting to um, construct our thoughts around that. Um, I think for me, what it would be is the, the, the knee-jerk response to that question is yes. Um, but I think what needs to be considered in the round is that there are already another number of obligations in the sector already for what landlords should be doing, particularly, for example, the Equalities Act, reasonable adjustments. We've got that listed in our complaint handling code as well, where there are already guidance notes, policies, strategies in place for what landlords should be doing to help people under certain circumstances. So any vulnerability policy that is devised needs to make certain it either cross-references what's already in place or it all comes under an umbrella of a vulnerability strategy but that everything is is handled together so that landlords are really clear to people about how they're defining vulnerability because that's one of the other things that we're seeing in our work as well that's both legal definitions and other things that crop up including transitory and that everything is clear and in one place and you can find it together and you don't have rubs between two different legal requirements or um, desired ways of working that then mean that what you get is a very confused response to somebody essentially approaching a landlord saying, I need help with this. Um, so yes to vulnerability policies, but not necessarily to a vulnerability policy per se at this stage. But I, it's very topical. We are looking at this in the round. Um, it's coming up in the other paragraph 49 investigations we're doing into other landlords. We are doing a spotlight report this coming year as well on communication and relationships. So all of that in the round is starting to form our thinking about this particular topic. So that's a very roundabout way of answering your question. <laughs> No, great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, just just to kind of add to that, I think I think we do all have vulnerability policies, as as Rebecca said per se. Then they may not be a standalone policy, and they are part of safeguarding. Um, and I think that we do look. I think one one of the things is you know we can have all of those in a policy, but what we're we actually doing in practice um, is is the key thing. So. In terms of damp and mould at the moment, you know, we straight away started a triage system so that when we got those 
reports, you know, flying into us, we were able to kind of look at, are there vulnerabilities in the household? Are there young children? Are there older people? Are there people with chronic long-term health conditions? And that helped us to kind of prioritise. So it wasn't just about the level of damp and mould that was in the home. It was about the vulnerability of that household. So I, I think a, a standalone policy, you know, um, I don't think it's necessary to have one, but I do think it should be incorporated into the majority of other policies that we have. Great. Thanks very much, Yvonne. Um, and then touching on um, Yvonne's comments there, which uh, relate to the kind of approaches to damp and mould, Emma has asked a question, Rebecca, which uh, you might want to touch on, which is, has the Ombudsman seen an improvement in the treatment of damp and mould repairs among scheme members since the Spotlight report was published? I, I don't think I can say with any certainty that we've seen an uh, increase, uh, an improvement in the treatment of the dump and mould repair at, at source, um, because quite simply, obviously, we see cases once they've gone through a complaint process and we aren't inspecting the original service provision request. So I can't speak with any authority on that. What we are seeing is landlords starting to realise that this is something that needs to be gripped and that they need to have dedicated proactive strategies to it. I will say, however, that we did an evaluation of the impact of the report um, a year later down the line. And whilst we saw landlords change some of the language around how they talk to their residents about the damp and mould, it was often euphemistic. So they changed the word lifestyle to internal environmental factors. Um, and we haven't seen as many landlords devise dedicated damp and mould strategies as we would like. We've deliberately beefed that up as a recommendation in our follow-up report um, because it is a different thing to a repair and it needs a dedicated strategy. We live in a damp country. It is a reality for our homes and it needs a dedicated strategy. Um, we have seen a lot of landlords look to embrace technology as a way of handling damp and mould. So getting that better data for understanding how their homes are performing. So things like measuring the, the humidity of a home, measuring the temperature during the day to work with residents to understand why the mould is happening in their particular home. That's a really good initiative. It's not necessarily all of the answer, but it's, it is, it's a step in the right direction. But I think the overriding thing I'd say is I still think the emphasis is too much on what is the resident doing in their home as to why the damper mould is happening. And there isn't enough of a focus on is the home ine ineffably set up to fail the resident um, for damper mould prevention. So I think it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction. It's by no means done. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Maybe one for you, um, Yvonne, um, which is a question from James, um, and it concerns uh, disrepair claims. And so it says, can I ask for any advice for landlords? So I think it's interesting to hear it from a landlord. Any advice for landlords where disrepair solicitors become involved and actually encourage tenants to make access for completing work difficult? Yes, I certainly can. So we, um, you know, this was a problem historically in certainly in I would say in Rochdale Manchester and surrounding areas we have a lot of door knockers disrepair solicitor door knockers and as we're coming into spring that's when they come around a lot more um, and they definitely were giving the impression that you shouldn't be letting us in but they were also um, I think it was a, even more I don't even know what the right word to say is, but, you know, they were pretending that they were from us. They were, you know, lots of what we would call underhand, really, dealings. Um, so this was a big issue, obviously, that that came out from um, a WABS case and, you know, we weren't able to get in. And I have to say that the um, we've, we've taken this up to the Secretary of State. So uh, Michael Gove, we made him aware, we were concerned. Um, his staff have told us that they have met with the legal society, the law society, um, to tell them that they have to give us access, that they can't be denying that and they should be encouraging it. So I think that this is known as an issue. I, feedback I got was that they were quite defensive at the time, but I think we just need to keep this pressure going. Um, and one of the things that, that we've started to do is where we believe that it is really underhand tactics with the solicitors. 
we are doing formal complaints to them and I'm probably in the process of taking one up to the their ombudsman just because I think we have to keep putting pressure on um, even when they tell the tenants that they shouldn't let us in we continue to try to get in and we have seen improvements in that so I think you know in the majority of the cases that we're handling now we are able to get in and do the work but that's not that's despite the solicitors is what I would say. Uh, great thanks very much Yvonne. So um, back to vulnerabilities it's a question that keeps coming up in the, in, 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 the, in the chat here so Two questions, uh, which are linked together. So um, Kim asks, will landlords consider those with disabilities in terms of damp and mould and vulnerability? And then Ben asks, let's find your question, Ben, where is it? Uh, I can remember it if I can't see it. Ben's question was, how do you train frontline workers to recognise a vulnerability? Um, yeah, how do you ensure your frontline workers don't miss, sorry, don't miss any vulnerability triggers? Uh, so Rebecca, do you want to have a quick go at that and then Yvonne? Sure thing. Um, I, I, the short answer to the vulnerabilities and disability question is yes. Um, anything where somebody is disabled and they have a damper mold, I mean, anything where anybody has a damper mold, they should be looking at the circumstances of the person. Um, and one of those circumstances could be a disability. And obviously, it doesn't have to be physical, it could be mental, it could be, it could be anything, it could be non visible as well, which sort of ties into the second question as well of how do you spot the triggers, because not all disability is visible. Um, and it does tie back to good knowledge information as well. So again, one of the things you've said is, people need to know their residents. If you don't know about the, the, the vulnerability that is that the resident has, you can't make the best decisions for them um, or, or make the best decisions in conjunction with them is a better way of putting it. So yes, damp and mold, if, it, if somebody has an underlying health condition that is affected by damp and mold, that absolutely should be considered in the response to the damp and mold report. It should be a front and centre conversation with anybody reporting damp and mould to explore them, their household and their situation in life for ass assessing in a very literal sense what that damp and mould impact therefore really is on that person and their family rather than making assumptions on anybody else. And then the... Um, spotting signs of vulnerability that's a really difficult one because a lot there are there are standard signs of vulnerability that are more known about than others in the sector and the understanding of what how someone's vulnerability could manifest is an ever-changing conversation um you know the the invisible disability conversation has only started in the last five years for example it's 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 constantly evolving and that's why it's really important that your policies get up to date with how you're defining vulnerability and what that looks like and that people stay abreast of the latest thinking about um, recognised disabilities, recognised vulnerabilities, how that might manifest, what that might look like, and that they are then written into the void standards, the inspections, the uh, objectives that maintenance operatives have to have. So, so I'll give a, a classic example that's known within the sector. Hoarding has the potential to um, create situations where damp and mould might um, might manifest and hoard, hoarding is sometimes a manifestation of a disability or a vulnerability so it, it, it's a circular conversation about your identifying as as they are surfaced that these sorts of things are potential triggers that somebody is vulnerable um, you keep that information up to date um, and you basically stay abreast of the current thinking. But also, if some, if you find out subsequently that somebody's been vulnerable and there were genuinely no triggers spotted or identified, that's when you do the post-incident debrief, if you like, um, using policy language. Um, but you do the lessons learned. Somebody manifested as vulnerable. We didn't spot it. Why didn't we see it? Why weren't we aware that that was the situation? So you stay curious to make sure that you stay on top of the situation because it's it will never be a concrete block written in stone of this is what vulnerable looks like it's it's ever changing and there are transitory vulnerabilities as well so not an easy one to just have set out i'm afraid can i just add on to that really um just a couple of things i think one of the things around having campaigns that keep this 
fresh for frontline staff. So, you know, we do have an eyes wide open campaign and, you know, you need to keep refreshing that as you go along. Um, and one of the things, you know, you can't, as you said, Rebecca, you can't identify, you can't spell out every vulnerability. You know, people are very different. And what we've said, the most basic is if it doesn't feel right, if there's something that just kind of raises a concern, then do you know, report it in to the, you know, the Eyes Wide Open campaign and we will get people out there who are perhaps more skilled, have got more kind of um, expertise to see what, what's happening. Um, you know, in social housing, the level of vulnerability in our tenants, as you know, has been going up over the, the past few decades um, and part of, part of that's because of the scarcity of properties. So I just think that every organisation should have a campaign to keep thinking about vulnerabilities. Great. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. So, Yvonne, a question for you, which has come from uh, Christina, and uh, um, and it, obviously um, uh, you've set out the activities the RBH has gone through in the in the last few months and under your stewardship. Um, this question is essentially, how do you afford that? So, Christina's question is, how did you find the additional funding to make the changes needed? To change culture and deal with the issue of damp and mold? So, um, I mean, we were fortunate in that, you know, we we are quite strong financially, uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the money's just sitting there waiting for you to be spent. And so some difficult decisions have to be made. Um, you know, we prioritise, we've prioritised two things. One is the quality of our existing homes. Um, and because of that, we have now paused our development of new homes for the next few years. Um, to enable us to concentrate on our existing homes. And I think those are decisions and the balance of that are what people need to take on an individual basis. But for us, you know, we we knew we had big issues um, with dump and mould. We knew that we had stock that we couldn't be proud of. And so that's become our priority. Something else has to stop. Um, but we've also looked at the what we would call the added value stuff that landlords provide to say, actually, you know, should we be spending our money on that or should we be spending it on the culture shift that's needed, on the training of all of our staff? Um, and again, it's those decisions that and those balances that you, you have to make. For us, it's about getting our core services right. Um, and then once we've done that, we can then look at what else it is that we should be funding. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. And then another question for, for you. Uh, you've touched on some of this, uh, but it's an opportunity to uh restate or re-emphasize elements of it so it's a question from paul uh, which is what plans uh does rbh have to ensure ongoing customer engagement across their homes and how will they demonstrate transparency to their customers okay so we're doing a, a, a fair bit of work as you would imagine around this um and we were looking at how we can make sure that the the tenant's voice is heard in lots of different ways so we are looking at some formal structures so groups but locality based groups people that want to get involved that way we're looking at some informal structures so that you know people can just send comments in um, digitally but we've also started reholding surgeries local surgeries um, and they have been you know very well received by the tenants i think some of it had kind of gone away too much through covid um, and we'd kind of got used to not being out and about as much. So we're really pushing. So our neighbourhood housing officers are back out working on patches, wandering their estates, talking to people, um, engaging with the customers. And as I said, holding regular surgeries and working with other agencies in those localities. So that was a, you know, a thing that I think had been lost, but we've kind of um, reset up. Uh, I can remember years and years ago, you know, right from many, many moons ago when I started in housing, that we used to say, you know, the housing officer really should know the name of the dog. They should know their tenants. They should know what's going on um, on those estates. And we're trying to get back to that. In terms of transparency, we've had, um, you know, we've increased the amount of communication with our, our tenants, try and, as I said, made me and the exec much more visible and available to people. So as we were going through, we have a recovery plan, 
Um, and as we are progressing that, we're providing updates so that people know where we're at and what we're concentrating on net, next. And I think, you know, you can use the web, we can use, but it's those drop-in surgeries that are really proving to be the best way of getting information out to our tenants. Great. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, folks, uh, thank you so much for all of your questions uh, and uh, for listening uh, during this uh, webinar. Um, I hope uh, you found it interesting and insightful. I hope you may have picked up some nuggets there to think about your own approach if you work for a landlord or for residents to think about their own engagement with, the, with their landlord. Um, a huge thank you to uh, Rebecca for taking us through the report and a huge thank you to Yvonne for, for uh, not, not going to ground, not going undercover, but, you know, coming along and sharing your experiences and your insights, um, given you're at the front line on, on, on these issues. So um, a big thank you and um, um, take care, everyone. See you soon. Bye bye, folks. Bye.